Hello and welcome to 11 of the Spotlight. I'm Mariette Ferreira. In this weekly show, we shine a spotlight on the best and brightest in the tech and financial services industry to try and understand what gets them going, growing, and what they think the future of financial services holds. But today on uh, Spotlight, I'm joined by Mark Winnitz, CMO at Rapid, and I can't wait to get into the discussion. Mark, how are you? I'm doing great, Maria. Thanks for having me on the show. Fantastic. Um, Mark, today we're going to chat a bit about your career, um, hear a bit more about Rapid. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the payments industry. Um, so let's dive in. Sounds great. To start with, l- give me your 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 one minute elevator pitch. Tell me about Rapid. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Rapid is like an easy button for payments. You know, we make it simple really for businesses of any size to implement localized digital payments experiences almost anywhere in the world. So with Rapid, you can accept or disperse funds in well over 100 countries and do that just from a single integration off of our platform and then actually be able to scale that business globally without having to build all the complex payment infrastructure that you have to contend with when you're working in different local markets around the world. So essentially Rapid just really makes it a very easy proposition for businesses to reach more customers just by offering all these different payment methods that exist in the world. Um, and it gets, you know, all of our customers into more markets around the world quickly. Nice. Um, stepping away from the, the sales pitch a little bit, um, mm-hmm. what what makes Rapid different, Mark, to your competitors, um, for example? Um, how do you guys differentiate? Yeah, so um, it really comes down to, I'd say, three things, Marriott. Um, the first thing is just how we move money. Um, and really, when you kind of look at the state of payments and commerce around the world, it's that issue of allowing you know, a, a business or, by extension, a customer of that business uh, to be able to either pay or to be paid. And that becomes a very complex construct um, you know, when you have to deal with different payment methods, you have to work kind of cross border in a lot of cases. Um, so really what we've created is essentially a global platform that has all of the, what we say, uh, as fintech and payment capabilities built into it. Um, and that encompasses everything from integrating into different local payment systems, which in and of itself is a really difficult proposition, uh, for any business, regardless of its size to, to, to do. Um, as well as all of the services that surround the payment itself, right? So, you know, when you are, um, you know, looking at uh, a payment flow, you're dealing with compliance and regulatory issues. There's tax issues. Um, When you're working cross-border, you have things like FX, um, complex settlement requirements that have sometimes multi-currency implications. So to solve all of this, Rapid's built really this unique platform um, that its underlying architecture has essentially what we would call a wallet. You can think of it like a ledger. Um, and it sort of replaces the need for a traditional bank account. So as we talk about, I'm sure we'll get into this today, the whole concept of embedded financial services. Um, you know, you've got to essentially have a bank account construct in every market you're working in to transact and work with customers. In Rapid's case, this underlying wallet infrastructure allows you to store and hold money and then move money without necessarily having to have a traditional uh, bank account to do all that. And then off of the platform itself, once we kind of step away from the money movement aspect, which in and of itself is complex, it's the kinds of capabilities off that platform that enable just a, a myriad of use cases. So there's really four elements to Rapid that make it very powerful. We have this ability to collect funds really anywhere in the world mostly, right? So as soon as you step outside of your home country and you work in another market, you know, consumers and businesses pay in different ways, right? You may have um, a market where it's heavy on cash or it's heavy on digital wallets, very common in markets like Asia, as an example. I mean, Europe, bank transfers are really, really big. You know, cards are big in places like the United States. 
you know, parts of Latin America and certainly in Europe as an example. So the collect product takes care of that. But we also have the ability at the same platform to disperse funds, right? So if you need to pay out a supplier or an end um, employee, like let's say in the gig economy, you want to be able to make that happen. Um, then we actually have a white label wallet. It's actually different from the wallet construct I mentioned that allows you to store and hold and move money. But we have clients that need that capability. And then we also have the ability to issue cards in some cases in some markets, those are physical cards. And then obviously we also do a lot of virtual card issuing. Anyways, all of those capabilities sitting on top of this platform that allows money movement and handles all of these different fintech capabilities. That's what really makes Rapid really, really unique. And then the last kind of leg of the stool would be once you have all of those capabilities, you're trying to you know, construct a solution around, you need to be able to actually reach into local markets around the world. And this is really Rapid's secret sauce is this ability to essentially uh, offer over 900 local payment uh, methods worldwide, right? So I want to be able to accept cash in a market like Bolivia or to, uh, use an e-wallet payment capability in a market like Malaysia. It's very difficult whether you're a small, medium or you know, business or you're uh, a, a very large enterprise to be able to kind of make that proposition work. And it's these three things collectively, I'd say, that are really what makes Rapid so unique. Amazing. Thank you for ta sharing that and taking us through that. Um, I mean, payments is such a um fast changing industry in itself at the moment um it so is. i can imagine for you and your team is also uh, an element of keeping up with that that i'd like to get into a little bit but um first i'd love to hear a bit about you uh, what is yeah. your role at rapid um and i mean you've been in payments roles before you've been in fintech roles before but um kind of what got you to this point yeah, yeah. So I'm the chief marketing officer of Rapid. Actually, I've just uh, um, been at the company now for three years, as of last week. So it seems like an eternity in a startup, <laughs> uh, but it's been it's been a very, very meaningful and exciting eternity, I would say. Um, so I was really the first uh, marketing hire for the company. I like to say, kind of not three guys in a dog, but more like thirty guys in a dog, kind of a startup. <laughs> so um, you know, definitely came in at a very early stage. I actually came in pre-Series B um, and really built out a global marketing organization. Um, and now I actually run a, a fairly large, you know, worldwide marketing team that operates, you know, pretty much in every major market around the world. Um, you know, in terms of where I, how I got here, you know, you know, from where I've been, you know, previously, obviously, as you mentioned, I've worked in fintech and in payments, you know, for, for, a fair amount of time. So I've actually worked in other global SaaS businesses. I've worked on the issuing side previously, as well as on the mobile banking side and even on the risk and compliance side, kind of all, all of those sorts of areas. Um, you know, and so it's just been a, a very um, interesting kind of thread through my career has been pretty much in every one of those you know, previous experiences, I've actually worked in global environments. So um, kind of view myself like a citizen of the world, you could say. I'm actually really well-traveled by American standards. So <laughs> been to well over 40 countries and I've always had this interest in just other cultures, you know, just the fact that, you know, people look at things differently. They think about things differently than, for example, you know, the United States where I live, um, different worldviews. And I've always found that really, really appealing. And so I guess that's kind of driven you know, my interest in actually payments, because it really is, quite frankly, a, a global, uh, um, you know, area to work in, but it has a very, very local construct to it. Um, and I think kind of that, that thread has sort of always run through that for me. I like that. Um, Mark, before this starts sounding too much like a job interview, um, I have one last, <laughs> <laughs> one last question about you and what brought you yeah. here today. Um, but, but why fintech? I mean, um, I, I know for myself, you know, it's such a dynamic industry to be part of. And, and in fact, it's such a privilege to be part of. Um, but but why FinTech? Why have you stuck to payments? Um, and, and are these sort of any other industries that you take inspiration from? You know, I, I'll tell you, I think what's been just, you know, fascinating about being part of FinTech now for well over a decade is that, uh, first off, it's honestly one of the most exciting sectors in the world because there's so many aspects to fintech it's a, it's a very large space to play in you know i feel really fortunate to have come in to wrap it and and been given the you know the responsibility and the privilege both i would say to essentially build um you know this global brand from from scratch and um you know when you start to work with you know companies around the world uh on 
difficult payments problems, um, what you really learn very, very quickly, Maria, is that it's just hard to solve you know, the, these problems. Um, there's so much that goes into a business just being able to do what that business wants to do. And I think, yeah, you know, the promise of fintech has been how do we kind of break the shackles of, mm-hmm. you know, legacy ways of thinking, legacy technology. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the legacy doesn't still exist. You very much have to interact with, you know, legacy technology, even in today's environment to work. But I think it, it kind of leads to a larger lesson, which is, you know, um, how do you how do you look at what exists and how do you take what's there and and make that better? You know, we don't actually view ourselves as disruptors of the system per se or the ecosystem of payments at Rapid. Um, but kind of going back to the why fintech kind of question you were asking, really we see ourselves taking what's there and actually making it so that it's much more workable um, to really expand and democratize commerce. And I think that's what's really so fascinating about, you know, kind of the rapid story and why I'm in fintech and why I'm at, at rapid is just this ability to, you know, come in, think on a very large, you know, literally a global scale, um, you know, and, and really, you know, bring forth a construct that changes, you know, how businesses are operating, um, whether they're dealing with other businesses or they're dealing with consumers. There's so many use cases that fintech can can bring forward if it's just thought about it in the right way, and I think that's sort of what's so fascinating to me. And I think it's also just one other point there. It's also, you know, one of the things that Rapid's really doing, and we'll probably get into this, you know, in this in this interview today. Um, it's just this idea of of embedded financial services and embedded fintech, and we really take a very expansive view at Rapid about what that means. It's actually much larger than the kind of au courant definition of you know, embedded, embedded fintech, um, there's, there is a great big world out there that needs a lot of help. Um, and the current way of, you know, where we sit today in terms of local payment systems that have been, you know, sprung up, you know, around the world in different markets. Um, no one thinks about that at a much wider zoomed out view. And I think, you know, the companies like Rapid that are, you know, using these fintech as a service platforms, you know, which are really allow you to, um, you know, deliver on the promises of embedded finance, that, that's what makes this so interesting. And that's why I think I'm so drawn to it. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they, there's, there's a lot of things that you touched on there that really resonates with me as well. But um, I, I think it's the ability to really influence and, and help solve real problems. I mean, we're sort of, you're in the, the, the B2B world, um, you know, so we are 11FS, but, you know, even still through the work that we do, through the you know, the, the technology, the solutions that we enable, it, it's fundamentally making a difference to people's lives, the way that, you know, the businesses that they can start, the business that they can run, like um, their access to money, their relationship with money. Um, yeah, that, it, it is a privilege to be part of that. I agree. Um, For sure. But, but Mark, sort of taking a step back, looking at sort of the, the payments world and uh, again, like you said, you were in payments before, and now you're sort of in the the uh, deep dark world of of B two B payments. How would you say it's changed over the past five years? Yeah, there there's definitely been uh, quite a bit of change. So you know, I think just this first aspect of moving to this concept that we call internally integrated fintech at Rapid, which a lot of people I think would say is more like embedded fintech, but it's essentially what I'd mentioned before, and it's the, it's sort of this this construct of how Rapid has viewed its systems and 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 the solutions that we've created and have brought to market. It's essentially, um, you know, being able to embed, you know, a a payments or financial services capability inside of a business process, right? Um, and so being able to do that, I think, is sort of key to you know kind of unlocking, you know, a lot of a lot of opportunity out there, you know, kind of in the B2B and B2C world. Um, and so I think that the, the, the foundational change, you know, that has happened is this recognition that you don't have to uh, just accept that um, things are the way they are based on local constructs, on, you know, immature or outdated technology. You should really be able to, you know, have a business objective and not let the technology get in the way of that. And I think that, um, you know, this move towards embedding fintech capabilities and financial services really into any kind of a, of a business process or a use cases, you know, is really, um, you know, 
kind of where the change is happening right now. And you and you sort of see this, and we can kind of talk about this. You know, you see that there's sort of this rise of things like ecosystems and ecosystem businesses and ecosystem models, um, where um, you've got now uh, a way to bring in a, a variety of different stakeholders that have some commonality to them and essentially allow them to kind of interact with each other and transact in ways that are, you know, meaningful for their businesses or for their consumers. So that that's probably, you know, the, the, the biggest change I would say on an ultra macro level, right? Now there's other trends that we all see. So for example, you know, uh, buy now, pay later is sort of a very current trend, you know, that we're seeing um, and that's sort of, you know, taken off. You'll, you'll continue, I think, to see, you know, kind of unique sort of let's call them point solutions, even if they're globally and at scale that kind of emerge as uh, more and more consumers um, continue to move towards digital payments. Um, but I think it's that sort of that nexus of, you know, the move towards digital payments that, you know, COVID has driven, quite frankly, and accelerated tremendously um, with this other idea of being able to implement um, financial services capabilities into a business process. And, and this is absolutely, you know, the future is unfolding, you know, in front of us right now. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I want to pick back up on a point that you made around sort of your audience and, and the sort of the solutions that you enable, um, because obviously you do that in many different ways. But um, I mean, the, the, the payments industry is obviously constantly evolving. Um, and, you know, for you, from a competitor perspective, um, you know, and equally for you uh, thinking about your, your audience, that's sort of the shape of what a competitor looks like and what a customer looks like is constantly evolving, right? Um, it is. So I'm interested, uh, let's let's pick on your sort of target audience uh, specifically, so the, the type of businesses that you would be working with. Um, mm. uh, what do they, how do you help them? What do they look like? Because, you know, th there's almost an element of, you know, every business is a, is a payments business. If they in some way, shape or form or process, you, what did you mention before, collecting funds, dispersing funds, reaching different markets, which, I mean, you could probably tick that box for a uh, majority of businesses. Um, so how do you think about your target audience? Yeah, so it's vast, I would say. Um, I think that's what we're really seeing in you know, Rapid's evolution and our own journey is that, you know, this 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 problem of, of local payments, which is really what it is, that essentially has a global element to it, um, impacts businesses, whether those are large scale enterprises. Um, so for example, one of Rapid's customers is Google. Um, so we work with them in, in one instance, we actually do several things with Google, but one of them is to work with application developers and to help um, those developers get paid um, through, you know, um, through things that they develop that get distributed through Google Play. So kind of an ecosystem type of business, right? Another example could be uh, working with, uh, you know, um, B2B suppliers, right? So in Latin America, we work with AB InBev. It's actually a very large, um, mm. uh, um, you know, beverage distribution um, company. And you know, they've got all kinds of suppliers that they need to kind of collect from, funds from, you know, all over the world, right? So, yeah, you know, there's lots of different kinds of enterprise, you know, plays there. If we were to kind of double click, you could say, um, you know, there are, you know, technology you know, platforms that we're working with. There are um, financial services uh, entities we work with. We do quite a bit of work, for example, in the the um, broker dealer space. So, for example, in Asia, Go Trade is a client of Rapids. They do fractional training, so that's a that's an example. Um, we're seeing things like online education and learning as a massive, massive element of uh, opportunity for Rapids. So, um, you know, that's another you know kind of what we would call an ideal customer profile that we would go for. Um, and then e-commerce, and we see e-commerce both at a large scale, right? So I kind of mentioned that that Google example, that's sort of one example, but we also work at the the, the long tail, right? So about, um, I don't know, well, I'd say really 18 months ago, Rapid made a decision really due to COVID where we greatly accelerated reaching out, answering to work with small and medium businesses. Um, and so we are now actually working around the world and have acquired thousands of customers, um, you know, at the SMB level that quite frankly are really trying to solve this, the same, same problem as, you know, Google or AB InBev or Uber is, is solving at a larger scale, right? They just want to be able to sell to customers, mm -hmm. collect funds or potentially even pay out money 
it depends on what the use case is. Um, you know, kind of no matter no matter where they are. So we do a lot of work on the SMB side now. We've got you know relationships in place with you know uh, platforms like you know Shopify and WooCommerce and Wix and so forth. Uh, but what this all leads to is you know really it's it's ecosystem businesses. It's really where the future of where everything is is headed. It's not even the future. It's now, yeah. and it's sort of those different audiences. Kind of whether you're a participant in the ecosystem, right? Like I'm a a merchant that's sitting on the back of a WooCommerce store, or I'm the ecosystem itself. I'm Google and I'm doing, you know, work with app developers and making, you know, Google Play a, a point of distribution. I think it's all of those kinds of, of um, different use cases is, is what the audience would be. And then I'd say one last thing, Maria, and it's, and it's a key thing I'd say for Rapid is, um, you know, uh, just yet another audience per se, it's not so much the, um, the, the target end customer, like whether it's enterprise or it's SMB, but it's also a lot of work um, happens, you know, with product and digital transformation leaders on the enterprise level, um, you know, payments people um, at the SMB side, it could be like a sole proprietor or a business owner. And then in some cases, in either of those, you know, constructs, it's developers, right? So there's a lot of, a lot of work we do at the developer level. Just on that point, then picking up on the sort of uh, almost the education piece, um, I can imagine plays a role in the work that you and your team does. So I'll, uh, I'm interested in, um, the, you know, payments is incredibly complicated and incredibly simple at the same time. <laughs> um, does that, uh, I, and I can imagine you and your team have to sort of flex depending on, you know, who you're talking to. Um so, and then the layer on top of that is different regions, you know, geographies, etc. Um, does that does that make your your offering easier, easier or harder to to actually market? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> all it's of the both, above, actually. <laughs> right, right. It's both. I think. I mean, I really, at the end of the day, um, yeah, there is a lot of education that has to exist just because. By its nature, what we're doing is very complicated. Just even to explain it in a very simple way is, is difficult, yeah. right? Even to sophisticated payments people, you know, you're talking about moving money and you're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, compliance and FX and the fact that you've got these different products and you can plug in all these different markets. That's, that's complicated, right? Um, I think, you know, what we've really learned is that um, what's been important is to essentially create um, a global brand, which Rapid did in a very unique and unusual way. And it's actually one of the reasons that we've become, you know, really one of the biggest fintechs in the world in a very short amount of time and, and really just about three years. Um, and it was essentially building a global brand story that at least made it resonant that about what was the art of the possible, right? That you could actually, you know, go really work anywhere in the world and not let the payment kind of get in the way, right? And that was a, that was a kind of a very, very, well thought out and really well executed strategy at a global level that happened kind of over a period of about, you know, two years to kind of really get the market to understand what we were trying to say to them so they could get that and then actually get it into the market for people to, to recognize. Um, then the, then the next bit of complexity is what do you do on a regional level? Right? So, you know, one of the uniquenesses of rapid is that it's a, it's a true global startup. I'm very, I would say untypical of most startups, right? So generally speaking, you know, most startups you think of, you kind of, you solve a specific problem, you go get product market fit, you know, that starts to take off and the sales curve goes up as the investors pour more money into it. Then at some point, you know, someone on the board of directors or the investors or the exec team says, oh, you know, we should go international, right? So like if you're a, if you're a US company, that means like going to Canada or the UK <laughs> or something, right? Like that's like what international <laughs> means, right? So Rapid's like literally the antithesis of this, where we essentially brought up the entire company globally almost at one time, sort of a build it and they will come model. Very untypical kind of way for a, a, a startup to scale mm -hmm. itself. And then what, and the reason that we were able to bring that all up at one time was because we had a very unique regional marketing construct. So we created the global brand story, which, you know, I've kind of referenced here and talked about, you know, what integrating FinTech meant or means, I should say. Um, and then we actually executed very specific, you know, marketing approaches in different markets around the world, different regions, um, and also in different countries um, to contextualize that. So it made sense in those local markets. So for example, in most of 2020, we launched ourselves into some of the biggest payments markets in the world, right? So Brazil, the UK, 
you know, Germany, the, um, you know, a whole bunch of markets where there was significant scale of businesses and consumers um, and, and had to talk in those markets at a very localized level about what it was Rapid was doing and how that you could work with Rapid, you know, based on, you know, this brand promise of being able to, you know, essentially accept payments anywhere you wanted to kind of go in, into the world. Um, so yeah, there is a lot that goes into it. We also, another thing that Rapid does quite a bit of is a lot of our own primary research. So we've actually invested quite a bit of money in understanding things like payment trends um, mm -hmm. uh, around different markets, you know, across the world. Uh, we're actually going to be launching, you know, next year um, in Q1, a whole thing called Rapid Research, which is really about, you know, um, bringing to you know, the world, you know, very, very specific um, payment trends and capabilities, um, you know, that that people need to consider as they're thinking of payment strategy and, and so forth. So there's a lot of elements and aspects to how you kind of, you know, get yourself out there and how you talk about it. And there's sort of no one thing, but it's it's a I'd say a mix of a, a global brand story that really makes sense no matter where you are and then kind of a tactical execution regionally. I really like that. I look forward to reading what did you call it? Rapid research. Um, yeah. But it sounds like this puts you in quite an interesting position to be able to support those businesses, you know, that, that sort of long tail of, of SMBs that you work with, where you can almost draw from your own experience and your own model. Because if, if part of what you're trying to, to help them do is, you know, uh, reach local markets and for fintechs to expand in new territories, you might not be advising them on their, their, their brand strategy, but you know there is something in sharing your own learnings in how that sort of uh, international span expansion looks like and how you could support those businesses. Is is that ever something that um, that you, conversations that you have or uh, um, that you're able to share with uh, with your audience? Um, yeah, I think we I think we do it in different ways, right? So I think. Um, you know, what's really important, I think, is for the business, regardless of its size, whether it's an enterprise or an SMB, to just understand like what 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 is payment what does payments represent today, right? And what does fintech represent? And and it's really you know, historically, you know, things like payments and trends around payments and all those things. At the end of the day, people view it as like a cost or a cost center. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to kind of switch our thinking around this that it's really now like a strategic imperative, right? That 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 um, you can utilize payments and if you have the right technology and the right kind of vision and the right roadmap and the right people to go execute, um, you can actually open up new markets. You can open up um, different business processes. You can mm -hmm. rethink how business is done, right? And so I think the educational piece to this is really, um, you know, things like agility, right? So one of the one of the big learnings and, and sharings of, what we've learned coming out of COVID is that if you're not digitally agile, like you're in huge trouble, you, you, you are not going to be able to survive. Right. And we've all, we've all, we've all personally seen that and lived through it. That's, I guess that's the one, one good thing out of COVID. If, if there is anything, it certainly isn't all the endless zoom calls. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's that, um, you know, this concept of agility really, really matters. And I think getting people to, to see what digital agility means and then be able to see um, how that that can work, you know, certainly in like a cross border construct, which is what rapid, you know, heavily believes in, you know, that's something that's really kind of worth, you know, spending time, you know, from an educational perspective. I, I think a second area is just this idea of, you know, kind of moving, moving technology, moving payments to the cloud, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's not so much that it's about, you know, people are using more e-wallets in Asia right now, or more transactions are happening around cash in a market like Mexico, although those things are both true. It's more, um, what is the, what, what is the set of technology constructs that you need to be able to access that can essentially make your business agile, right? So, you know, Rapid's a great example of this, and there are obviously we have competitors that do the same thing, but it's just this idea of moving things to the cloud um, so that you get essentially you know, much more flexibility in what you're trying to do. And then kind of as a extension of that, um, you know, one of the things that we actually spend a fair amount of time on is um, as part of our expansion uh, approach, it's not just going out, educating in the market, launching in these different markets, talking about how we can help these businesses expand themselves. Sometimes it's something as simple, Marriott, as just 
acquiring companies in specific markets mm -hmm. that have a lot of customers, let's say they've got a really good installed base, but they've got like outdated payments infrastructure, right? Um, so, you know, a, a big initiative inside of Rapid is to essentially find um, the right kinds of companies to acquire, you know, bring them better technology, bring them better experience, you know, bring them a roadmap that allows them to operate globally at scale and, you know, kind of give them a better path than they ever would have had or ever, or ever would have had thought about, I think. And so I think, you know, when we talk about education and we talk about, you know, kind of how to set the construct for, you know, how to think about this, you know, it's, it's, you know, part of it's the education in the, the typical way we were talking about just a minute ago, but it's these other kind of elements I think are equal as important that kind of help the market kind of understand, you know, kind of what's possible. Yeah, I like that. Um, you mentioned the start um, that there's sort of this mindset that, you know, payments is a cost. Um, but it, yeah. in fact, sort of, you know, as you just explained, there's sort of a, a, an element of, you know, it's enabling growth. Um, if, if you were to sort of give advice to, you know, a, a fintech now this time of year, I think we're all sort of, you know, in 2022 budget planning process, thinking about our plans look like for next year. Um, what would you, what, what sort of questions or what, what, uh, issues rather do you come up against apart from, you mentioned, you know, this mindset that payments is a cost. Is there any other sort of challenges that they face that you are trying to support them on um, yeah. as, you know, they are looking ahead to moving into new territories? Yeah, that's that's a complicated question. And I think there's a lot of aspects to it. But I'd say, honestly, the number one thing we think about, and I think any startup needs to be thinking about, regardless of where you are in your evolution, right? Whether you're like, you know, Series A and you're just kind of getting started or you're, you know, uh, you know, a Series E company like Rapid, you know, we're now the, you know, the biggest, um, you know, uh, tech startup in Israel and a, you know, wow. multi, multi-billion dollar tech valuation, or sorry, valuation, I should say. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter what your size is. You need to really understand, do you have product market fit for what you're trying mm -hmm. to do? And I think that that actually varies, can vary considerably by the geography, right? So um, if you're thinking of geographical expansion, that question becomes, you know, pretty foundational. You know, do you do you have the right kind of product market fit? Um, I think the 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 second thing, um, and it's another area where where we spend uh, an inordinate amount of time. Uh, I I personally do, as well as you know, other senior leaders inside of Rapid, is you have to have the right talent to be able mm -hmm. to to scale. You know, and talent acquisition, it's hard anyways. It's really hard right now, right? I mean, I, I think, um, you know, we're all seeing globally, you know, this sort of this, this war for talent that exists yeah. and you can't, you cannot scale without having, you know, excellent people Good and, people, yeah. you know, yeah. And that's, that, that's a hard thing because, you know, one of the things we've seen, um, you know, we're now, we're now fortunate, you know, we're big enough where we, we, we have some level of, you know, being known out in the market. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of very talented people that come from, you know, companies that have done big things inside of, you know, payments and fintech at big name, you know, companies, you know, will look at rapid, but, but sometimes that's not always the right fit. It's not, you know, pulling, you know, somebody out of, um, you know, a multi-billion dollar revenue, you know, global payments company, that is really what you need. It could be, no, but, but sometimes it's not. I mean, sometimes it's just having people be able to look at a problem and think about it in a different way, um, you know, and be able to kind of try and experiment with sort of different approaches on go to market strategy or messaging or, you know, putting some new technology into the market, getting feedback quickly and seeing, you know, how the market reacts. And so I think, you know, you've got to have that kind of test and learn, you know, mindset um, and then be able to also walk away when something isn't working. And I think that's also the really, really difficult thing is, especially when you're trying to, to, to go global, uh, which Rapid, I think, understands really, really well. Now, um, you know, when, when we first started going to different markets and different parts of the world, it, we had a lot of people that knew stuff about those markets, but it's one thing to kind of know something about a market. It's another thing to actually actively work in it with the product mm -hmm. you're trying to sell and see what you get. And I think, you know, you just have to be very careful in terms of picking those markets, making a bet with a hypothesis testing it out and then sort of being able to read the signal from the noise and then seeing like, okay, do we either it's working? So let's go. It's sort of TBD. So do we go, do we not go? 
it's not working. What's wrong? Do we try to fix it or do we, do we step away? And I think it's a, it's a mix of, you know, these issues around product market fit, you know, having the right kind of talent and then, you know, just sort of being able to kind of make a decision on, you know, do you keep going or, or do you not? And then it's this last point. I think it's pretty interesting where, you know, the first year we were talking about rapid when I got here and, you know, end of 2018, beginning of 2019, a lot of people didn't really understand what we were trying to do. I mean, everybody talks about embedded fintech now and embedded mm-hmm. finance, like it's a thing and it's a thing. And we were talking about that in 2018 and no one knew what that term was. Or when it, it wasn't meant. a thing. <laughs> yeah, when it wasn't a thing, right. And so you're kind of like, we're looking at each other like, do we get it? You know, or, 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 or like, are we crazy? Is this idea? <laughs> well, we just had of, you a know? curve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's a hard thing. So I think, you know, I think you have to, I mean, this is going to sound kind of, you know, cliche, but it's true. You have to kind of take some, take some risks sometimes, but it's, it's sort of being able to kind of read kind of what happens when you kind of take that risk and then kind of adjust, which is key. And I think it's a really big part of Rapid's DNA is that we're really, really good at putting something out there, seeing if it works and then sort of kind of making an adjustment and kind of moving it to the right place. So. Yeah, I, I like that. These, it feels like these three very important nuggets that you've mentioned there. So the, the product market fit, um, I couldn't agree more with, you know, making sure that you have the right people. Um, and how do you use that opportunity, especially as, you know, companies go more global to, you know, empower more sort of more of a diverse workforce um, and then be quick on decision making, um, you know, start, stop, continue, um, make a decision and move on. Um Mark, we're coming to the end of the show, but um, before we finish off, um, I've got one last question for you and you can choose how you'd like to answer this. Um, What what advice would you give to your younger self? Yeah, yeah. Um, You know what, Marianne, I'll tell you, it's really natural, I think, to second guess yourself when you're younger. You know, um, I think people are worried about what other people think about them. You're kind of worried about kind of putting yourself out there and, you know, saying something which may or may not be right, or it may not be um, maybe as well thought out as you would hope it to be, because maybe you just don't have all the experience. And I think, um, you know, it, it's it's okay to make mistakes, right? Like I, I tell my team, um, like there's no problem making mistakes. Like I just need you to be able to make decisions, right? Mm-hmm. So I like um, I'd say the first thing is like, you know, don't second guess yourself. Uh, don't worry about what people think make decisions and don't be afraid to try things. Like that's what that decision-making process is for. I mean, try to have a good, well thought out thesis for what it is you're putting out there. Um, Maybe think about solving a problem in a different way. You know, worst case you failed, but you learned something. Um, I think the sooner in your career you can get comfortable with with that and that whole idea of making decisions, um, you know, I I think the better off you are. So I think I I wish if I had known that earlier, I, I. I would have applied it earlier. So I love that. That's great advice. Um, Mark, before we wrap up, um, tell me what's next for Rapid. You know, we are really, really focused, Mariette, I think coming off of, you know, really two very large capital raises in 2021, right? We did a series D and an E. So those were $300 million rounds a piece. Um, so quite a bit of money raised. Um, and, you know, for us, you know, we are just so hyper-focused on, you know, building a world-class, you know, global fintech, you know, our, our, like our aspiration is to be really, if not the biggest, certainly one of the biggest fintechs in the world in the next, you know, three to five years. Um, you know, we are continuing to, um, you know, uh, serve these enterprise markets, work with these technology startups, and also work in the SMB side. We'll be announcing in the next 12 months, you know, several new partnerships. Um, we've got, you know, acquisitions that we are working on that we you know, hope to announce sometime in the next several months. So I think all of these things kind of, you know, rally around this concept of really being able to, um, you know, serve this sort of concept of, you know, global financial services. And, um, you know, we think we're well positioned to do that. Amazing. It sounds like it's an exciting time to be part of the Rapid team. It's very exciting, for sure. Um, that brings us to the end of the show. Mark, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah. Where can people find out more about you um, and about Rapid? Yeah, absolutely. No, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so people can go to rapid.net. It's R-A-P-Y-D. We're the flag all day today. <laughs> um, yeah, we're very active on social. So uh, you can catch us on LinkedIn uh, and on Twitter. Uh, we're also doing more stuff on Facebook and Instagram. So those are kind of the obvious places. And uh 
yeah, I'm around out in the ecosystem. So if people want to reach out, I'm happy to happy to chat wherever they can find me in the digital world. Fantastic. Um, right. That's all we, that we have time for this week. Um, make sure that you follow 11FS, also LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. We're all over them. Um, stay updated with all the cool stuff that we get up to. Um, and if you enjoy the show, um, enjoy, uh, subscribe. Sorry, I'm going to do that again. Sorry, George. <laughs> Right, that's all that we've got time for this week. Make sure that you follow 11FS on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we're all over the socials. Um, stay up to date with all the cool stuff that we do. And if you enjoy the show, subscribe to us on YouTube. Um, we can also catch the previous shows. Um, have a great week, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>